welcome at this conference call of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Sciences and the Arts. Today, we launch a new position paper, number 67 in our series of position papers. It deals with genome editing for crop improvement. It summarizes the discussions at a public symposium on the same subject that was held in Brussels in November 2019, in better times. That meeting, organized in cooperation with ALIA, all European academies, brought together experts, policymakers, civil society organizations, and the interested public to assess and discuss the impact of the notorious ruling of the Court of Justice of the European Union on research and developments in genome editing for plant breeding. Today, we can present an interesting document that grew out of this meeting. There is an English version and a Dutch one. I strongly want to thank everyone that participated in its realization, especially Dirk N.C., Uwana Dima, Hubert Bokken, René Kusters, and Pere Puig Dominic. I also want to thank the participants in the debate and for sure Godelieve Geisen, who will lead the panel discussion. She is Professor of Microbiology at Ghent University and member of our class of natural sciences. Professor Geisen, the floor is yours. So first of all, um, a short overview will be given by Professor Dirk Inzee from Ghent University. He is also director of the VIB Department Plant Systems Biology, and he's also a member of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Science and the Arts. Professor Inzee, you have the floor. So first of all, thank you for all this, uh, for all the participants um, of this uh, meeting. And, um, um, so this was an, an a symposium organized, as already settled by the, um, the Royal Academy like of, uh, of Belgium for Arts and Sciences and um, together with ALEA. And in fact, um, um, what we try to address the, like, is in this symposium is how um, genome editing can be used for crop improvement and what the consequences of the ruling of the European Court of Justice uh, are for European uh, agriculture and food security and like in general. Let me first uh, start uh, by uh, quoting a very famous uh, person uh, like that we need to learn how to work with nature uh, rather than against uh, it. And um, what he actually is referring to Alec, is that the impact Alec, of uh, human activity of human mankind on our planet, planet is really getting uh, very dramatic, uh, partly due to the fact that uh, world population is still exponentially growing. We'll soon will be with 8 billion Alec, people. Also this, uh, the use of fossil fuels and and economic activity in general um, uh, caused an enormous increase in greenhouse gases with climate change as a consequence. And, and this goes together with uh, disappearance uh, like of nature biodiversity at an unprecedented uh, like rate. And we, um, as the scientific community, is very much convinced uh, that uh, crop improvement, in fact, uh, can be an important uh, factor in contributing to make our planet uh, much more uh, sustainable. For example, uh, we can develop disease-resistant varieties, which so uh, leading to less chemicals and an eco-friendly agriculture, improved nutrient use efficiency, um, so less eutrophication and uh, and pollution like, of waters, resilience to drought and eat, uh, which of course in climate change condition will uh, contribute to food security. Higher yields, like, in fact, which uh, leads to that you need less land to produce food. And if that's used, that land is unused like, in a proper way, it can further increase to rewilding and increasing biodiversity. Also improving nutritional qualities, uh, leading to healthy food, more diver diversification traits in current varieties, uh, preser preservation of local varieties, 
and uh, bioenergy crops in the transition uh, to a carbon neutral economy. And also we can think uh, on the development of new uh, uh, wild uh, domestication of wild varieties. This, at least part of these uh, goals are also part of the uh, European Green Deal and the farm to fork um, uh, goals which have been uh, made into that. Now, um, we think of that for this crop improvement uh, that there will be um, a big need uh, like for the use uh, like of genome editing, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if we want to address these problems and, like, in a fast, efficient and affordable way. Like, and I think genome editing became very much into the picture. It's a new method uh, to uh, modify, uh, to look for changes in the, in the genetic blueprint for organisms was only been discovered or worked out like something like 10 years ago, like, but now already this year, as most of you will be familiar with, uh, these two ladies received uh, the Nobel Prize. And I can't, um, now, um, let me um, um, first uh, uh, take you a little bit uh, back what crop improvement uh, is. So we actually, mankind is doing that already for the last uh, 10,000 years. In fact, uh, almost uh, actually all everything what you eat, uh, like in fact, uh, like is is really is the product uh, like of plant breeding, plant domestication. And for example, if you look to the current uh, maize like here uh, uh, with this uh, big cups with many kernels, well, the ancestor is a plant which still grows in like in Mexico, Teosinte, which hardly has a few seeds. It will surprise you like, like for example, that this wild uh, mustard, I guess not too many people would eat all that, that this gave rise to all kind of cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprout, like, and so on. Another example is this wild tomato with uh, very small fruits, which gave rise like, to a wild, uh, a, a wide variety of different uh, tomatoes like, and that you all know like, so well. So how is the, are these changes actually obtained? Like, in fact, um, well, they are obtained uh, by changing in the genetic blueprint and the DNA uh, like of um, organisms, of plants. And in fact, if this uh, bars, uh, this uh, vertical bars represented genetic information, there are various ways uh, that you can actually look for variations in that genetic blueprint. And first of all, this variation occurs spontaneously with a very low frequency. Nevertheless, it occurs in every plant around the locus. If you would take a, a, a feed like for example with corn and you will look at uh, look at every plant individually you will find uh, different uh, mutations but then people have learned uh, like also with the lobes uh, like of um, uh, uh, Gregory Mendel really that you can uh, breed um, uh, plants which are close closely related uh, to each other one can mix genetic information and one can look for changes for example which are uh, present in the wild variants and introduce this in uh, to uh, like a more more, uh, more productive uh, variety. Um, later on, like in fact, something now more than 80 years ago, another way was discovered like, to introduce uh, variations in the genetic information, this is mutagenesis. In fact, the uh, idea like, like here that plants like, like, were exposed like, to mutagens, chemical mutagens or radiation, and that induces actually a large number of different uh, variants, and then you select after a lot of work then these variants, which give you beneficial characteristics, for example, disease resistance and, like in, uh, and then you uh, work further with that. Uh, you have to realize that more than 3000 varieties of plants that we eat, some of them uh, daily, uh, for example, all the barley for beer production uh, is actually obtained by mutagenesis. Many durum wheat varieties, the same and so on, uh, like so for pasta and so on, are obtained by this uh, method. A more uh, recent uh, method is even genetic modification, uh, which is best known as GMOs, where you introduce uh, f mostly foreign uh, DNA with a, with a certain characteristic, with a, uh, a favorable gene into the genome of plants. And this technology is now used uh, like all over in the world, and, um, and particularly in North and South America and in Asia, like in fact, like Australia, uh, for in a number of different uh, like crops. Like unfortunately, like in fact, not like in Europe. 
And then do you have the, the last like, addition, this genome editing, what was the subject of this meeting, which is actually a, a way to introduce like in a very precise, if, uh, efficient and affordable way, uh, changes in energetic information without any foreign DNA, which is left behind. In fact, it's very much the same as the spontaneous mutation, but the only difference actually that is now that it is directed. The spontaneous mutations are random and you have to look very hard like, and it's time consuming. It's very expensive to find the, the, the variation which is favorable while genome editing, you know what is favorable and you actually introduce directly the mutation. In fact, one cannot distinguish in fact what you obtain by nature and what you obtain by genome editing. This, um, uh, this however, um, was uh, judged uh, like in, in a very different uh, way like by the European Court of Justice, and that will be explained um, furthermore by Professor Bokken. Uh, but we ruled that, that in, despite the fact that this is identical to what you obtain in nature, that genome editing plants should be considered uh, like GMO. This observation, in fact, uh, like in which is um, goes very much uh, against the, the nature of what, the, what this uh, genome editing is all about, sparse to, like an enormous amount of scientific uh, protest and unbelief. And these are just uh, like a list uh, like of all uh, European mm -hmm. institutes uh, like where leading plant scientists and often whole departments uh, like express their concern that Europe should not miss out uh, like on this uh, technology. In total, there are now 133 different institutes like an organization which actually um, uh, signed uh, like that uh, genome editing crops obtained uh, like, uh, by this technology and which do not contain foreign DNA should not be exempted to this GMO um, uh, ruling. So this, if you want to learn more about that, I refer to uh, like a website uh, like where all this information and this position papers are also actually uh, can be seen. Not only did the scientific community uh, react uh, very much against uh, that, but all kinds of, uh, kind of other organizations. Uh, for example, it was a very important statement uh, like of the group of chief scientific advisors of the European uh, like Union. We had uh, like also this 20 million uh, farmers uh, like, um, organized in Copa Cogica, uh, also expressed their concern. Uh, like there are many academies uh, like expressed their concerns and so on. This list is in fact uh, like much uh, longer all actually um, breeding companies uh, like in Europe express their concern uh, and so on. So this, um, so this is a kind of uni, unisono um, um, uh, uh, this message that this uh, actually is not good uh, like for European agriculture and uh, like food uh, security. This is also the view that we see actually all over the world. Uh, this is the current uh, map like, of regulatory approaches. Uh, you can see actually that like, all countries <coughs> like in uh, green, like here, Canada, United States, and many uh, countries in South America uh, already consider genome editing crop as not regulated as a GMO. And uh, also it's safe for Australia, even Japan, which is traditionally uh, was very much opposed to GMO. They also are in favor of genome editing. And in many other countries, like in fact, there is an ongoing debate, which is very much leaning towards approving this technology also for crop improvement. So this, um, in this meeting and symposium that we organized, we came to a number of recommendations. And I will not read all these recommendations. Actually, the list is much longer than what you see like here. But in fact, the, um, the symposium concluded uh, that uh, we have to revise the existing GMO directive. Uh, like, and, um, and we have to uh, exempt uh, like a genome editing, particularly uh, when genome editing does not lead to changes that, uh, that, um, uh, that also can occur to, uh, naturally. So this would be identical to what natural occurring changes. I would not introduce foreign DNA. These should be exempted for the application of the GMO legislation. And and this really for the benefit and welfare of all European citizens. Furthermore, at the symposium concluded that uh, uh, genome editing uh, uh, as regulated GMO leads to a significant and unfair competitive disadvantage for European public and private plant breeders. We come back to that later in the meeting. 
And furthermore, I'll get uh, concluded that the legislator should not rely on hypo hypothetical assumption, but on scientific evidence. And, again, um, and furthermore, um, the symposium called for a an, an, uh, an broad dial dialogue uh, on this new breeding technologies, and again, with all stakeholders and with the public like, at uh, large. Thank you very much. And um, I would now pass on the word uh, to Professor Geissen. So thank you, Professor Inzi, for the short overview. Now that you have set the scene, we can go into some detail on the specific aspects. And we will do that with the authors of the position paper who are also members of the panel today. So we have Dr. Owana Dima, Science Policy Manager at VIB, Professor Emeritus Hubert Bocken from Ghent University, expert in liability law, and he's also a member of the Royal Flemish Academy for, of Belgium for Science and the Arts. Mr. René Kusters, Regulatory and Responsible Research Manager at VIB. Professor Perry Push Domenic from the Center for Research in Agricultural Genomics in Barcelona. And he's also an ALEA board member. And the topics that we will discuss, we try to structure the panel discussion or on the next slide. So here you see that we go in detail first to the legal analysis, then to some genome alterations and science-based risk analysis, detection of gene edited events and trade disruption, economic consequences, and finally the policy options reviews. So um, the idea is that one member will start with a statement. And then after that statement, the other members can add their remarks on the basis of their own uh, background. And I would like to ask uh, Professor uh, Bokken to start with the legal analysis of the ruling of the European Court of Justice and also the implementation thereof in France. Professor Bokken, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Before going into detail on the decision itself, I would like, I would like to make three general points. Um, we all know that uh, this decision has given rise to a passionate debate um, about the desirability thereof. But I think that sometimes and probably often several questions are intermingled. Um, we could discuss the question whether the court could have decided otherwise, whether it should have decided otherwise, whether its interpretation of the GMO legislation is correct, whether the scientific data which it uses are correct. Maybe we, on these points, know better than the court. Uh, we can discuss whether it leads to a satisfactory result. But there is also the question uh, what the court actually decided. And if we want to determine the present legal status of the genome editing, the last question is the relevant one. Uh, if we are able to determine the uh, legal status, we can also determine whether it is satisfactory or not, and uh, how we should deal with it then. And then I should think that uh, if it is not satisfactory, we should start from the idea that courts are not the appropriate institutions to develop detailed rules on complex technical and scientific issues on which the legislator has not yet pronounced himself. First point. Second point, uh, the decision in question is not a routine decision which has been lightly taken. Um, it is rendered in ground chamber of the court, which means by 15 judges presided over, the president, over by the president of the court himself which is fairly exceptional. Generally, there are three or six judges. And uh, exceptional is also that it has been rendered after a clearly contradictory opinion of the Advocate General Bobek, which also is uh, fairly exceptional. So I would say it's not a decision which has been lightly taken. Uh, a preliminary ruling is not a decision on appeal. A decision on appeal where the deciding court decides on all issues of the case. A preliminary, in a preliminary ruling, the court 
of the European Court provides only one small piece of the puzzle, uh, which is laid out by the domestic court, namely, what is the exact meaning of a provision of European law? Uh, that ruling on that point is binding for the referral court. Um, and that's the limit of the task of the European Court of Justice. It does not decide on scientific issues. Um, the national court is to dispose of the case in accordance with uh, the uh, court's, uh, European Court's decision, but it is the national court that decides on factual issues. And uh, when it refers to factual issues, the European Court proceeds on the basis of statements by the referring judge. It does not call on expert itself. To fully understand the issues before the European Court in this type of procedure, we must take into account uh, the underlying litigation and the referral decision. Uh, this is, these decisions are documented in the European Court judgments, but if one has not sufficient information there, you can go to the national domestic uh, decision. And in this case, this is a decision of the Council of State of France. Um, to give you a short view on the litigation leading to the European Court, uh, the, it starts in 2014, a, an NGO, Confédération Paysanne, wants to obtain a ban of um, herbicide-tolerant uh, canola varieties, uh, which under French law at that moment are accepted on the basis of an article 531.2 of the French Environmental Code. So the Confédération asks the Prime Minister to withdraw that provision on the basis of a number of arguments, but he gets no answer from the Prime Minister. In the French law, this means that the request is rejected. Then the Confédération uh, starts a procedure before the highest uh, French administrative court to obtain the annulment of the implicit refusal to abrogate the question uh, the uh, provision in question, and also to oblige the French government uh, to suspend the use of a number of varieties of herbicide tolerant uh, canola. Um, maybe we can have a look at uh, slide eight, which gives us uh, the text of the article of the French law. The next one, please. Uh, yes, slide eight, where we read that uh, the French regulation states that techniques referred to in, etc. I think uh, this is, uh, according to my data, this is slide 10. I would like to go back to slides. Yes. Yeah, no. And further, yes, uh, techniques referred to in Article 5312, which are not considered to give rise to genetic modification, important, are mutagenesis. We see a similarity with the provision of the European uh, GMO directive. Uh, then the procedure before the Conseil d'État develops, and all the issues which we see in the um, decision of the court are brought forward, namely uh, whether or not um, uh, mutagenesis is a form of genetic modification, uh, whether the modern techniques of directed mutagenesis uh, are um, falling under the uh, directive. Um, I will come back to these points, uh, but uh, there is also another issue which uh, is mentioned in the uh, decision of the French Conseil d'État, and which is interesting uh, to look at because it will come back uh, at a later moment in what I'm telling. And then um, I would like to use what I have uh, as 
slide 11, issues before the Conseil d'État 2. Next one. Um, the Conseil d'État, as I said, the European Court of Justice does not deal with the findings of facts by the domestic court. The Conseil d'État makes a distinction between random mutagenesis in vivo and random mutagenesis in vitro and says that the second one is only developed after the adoption of the directive. Uh, I will uh, refer to that later. You may say that this is probably a wrong statement, but that is not submitted to the European Court, which is not to decide on issues of fact. So a number of questions are submitted, questions of law are submitted to the European Court. And I would like uh, to go to uh, the next, uh, to slide 10, uh, slide 12, I'm sorry. Yes, this is the one. Uh, so the issues submitted by the Conseil d'État to the European Court of Justice are do organisms obtained by mutagenesis constitute GMOs? Are all techniques of mutagenesis exempted or only those existing prior to the GMO directive? These issues are arising before the Conseil d'État. Um, they're submitted to the ECG. And then you see there, and you know, the answer given by the European Court of Justice, a summary. Each of these sentences here can be um, proven by specific reference to a paragraph of the court. The product of mutagenesis is to be considered as a GMO. Um, only exempted are techniques which have been conventionally used and have a long safety record. And products obtained by means of new techniques which have appeared since the directive of uh, 2001 are not exempted. That is, uh, as a summary, uh, the um, statement by the European Court of Justice. What it says, not we think, what we should have be said, been saying or what it could have said. If we take this as a fact, not everybody agrees, but should we take this as a fact about the meaning of the court's decision, then we can uh, go to slide 19 uh, and conclude uh, that uh, this is a frozen interpretation of the mutagenesis uh, exception, but the long safety record, according to the court, must have been established at the moment of the enactive enaction of the directive, which means that all forms of genome editing developed after 2001 are not ex excluded and fall under the uh, genome editing directive, genome uh, GMO directive, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we can easily conclude that this is an unsatisfactory result, and we also can be surprised uh, when we compare it uh, to the uh, position of General uh, Advocate General Bobek, who says that you should interpret general categories in view of the scientific developments. Um, we can also be surprised when we see that the European Court has taken in essential matters of constitutional law, very bold position and adopted very creative solutions. Uh, the European Union would not be what it is without the court. Why doesn't it do the same in this case? I think a court is not the appropriate institution to develop complex and detailed rules in scientific and technological matters which have not yet been regulated by the legislator. You can agree or you can disagree, but I think that is a fact. If we briefly then come back to the uh, French situation, um, the uh, French uh, situation, um, first, the Conseil d'État has to implement this decision. It follows the interpretation uh, of the court's decision, which I have given, um, but maybe slide 20 adds something which is uh, fairly surprising, thank you. Both the directed or genome editing techniques, as well as the techniques of in vitro mutagenesis, 
appeared after the date of the directive and must be regarded as being subject to the obligations of the directive. A distinction is made between in vitro and in vivo on plants it themselves, uh, mutagenesis. Uh, what happens further in France, uh, slide 23, uh, we come to a draft decree uh, of the French government, which amends uh, the previous uh, provision which I have been uh, referring to. And it now reads that um, except are not considered, so I'm sorry, uh, re re techniques which have been traditionally used without proven harm for public health are random mutagenesis with the exception of in vivo random mutagenesis. So surprising distinction in the French uh, proposed new uh, provision of the environmental code. The result is that plant organisms resulting from in vitro random mutagenesis will fall within the scope of the regulation and the number of uh, plants will be prohibited for culture in France. Uh, this is a draft decree. Next slide, if you wish. A draft decree, uh, which has to be uh, notified to the Commission, slide 24, uh, to the Commission person to the Single Market Transparency uh, Directive. And the Commission uh, is uh, in the position as a number of other countries, as other member states rather, uh, to react uh, to the uh, draft provision. And the Commission says, well, um, the draft that you propose is in breach with European law. Uh, the distinction uh, between uh, in vivo and vitro random mutagenesis uh, finds no basis in European law and is in fact not correct. Um, it's not correct to say that in vivo, in vitro did not uh, exist before 2001. And then uh, the draft uh, which you have prepared is also not compatible with the European seed legislation. The Commission ends with saying, uh, well, if you don't change the draft, we'll start an enforcement procedure. Uh, so this is to be continued in France. But I think the main conclusion that I would draw from the European court's decision is one, it is clear in my opinion, uh, the French government interprets it exactly uh, as in the slide which I have so shown. And basically we should address the issue by legislation, not by referring to judges to solve these complex issues. There is no doubt that the present state of the law with respect to genome editing is not satisfactory. Uh, it, does not, uh, in, it is not in line with the developments in many other countries. I hope that I have been able to make myself clear. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bokken. Uh, who of the panel would like to comment on this statement or has a question? Um, maybe I can um, make, a, make a small comment uh, to what Professor Bocken has said, well, specifically about the situation in, uh, in, in France. Um, the European Court has made very clear that when you apply the technique of mutagenesis, that the resulting organism is a genetically modified organism. If you read the legislation in France, then there is a difference there between the French legislation and uh, the European legislation because in France, the way the exemptions have been formulated in French law, um, uh, the application of, um, well, I would say the conventional, the, 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 uh, the, the random mutagenesis does not lead to a genetically modified organism. So they, 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 there's a difference there. Um, and what is now happening in France is also a little bit peculiar um, in the sense that they have made that distinction between um, in vitro and in vivo random mutagenesis and um, also only specifically applied to 
plant cells. Uh, so when you apply these things on, on other organisms, then uh, uh, you're not within that uh, same category. Um, and they have been setting up lists of uh, varieties of plants that um, would, well, um, now have a different regulatory status uh, based on the changes that are proposed in the French legislation. And uh, apparently there are only um, canola uh, rapeseed varieties on that list. Um, I'm a, li a little bit surprised by that and I don't really understand what is, what is, what is happening there. Um, um, may I react to your first point? It is indeed uh, true that the French article um, 531.2 uh, does not, does explicitly say mutagenesis is not a form of genetic modification. However, this provision is changed in the new draft. It doesn't say that anymore. Um, because this is a decision of the European Court, uh, and the decision of the European Court is based on uh, the provisions of the uh, directive itself. Um, I have only seen a number of uh, implementing proposals. I'm sure that if this is adopted, uh, one no doubt we'll have to make other lists as well of plants that are or are not um, to be produced anymore. So we still have a draft decree and it has to be implemented. It's now clear that the draft decree may not uh, go on as it is uh, presently drafted. If France takes that decision to withdraw all these plants from cultivation, what will be the consequence for Europe? I could not, uh, well, it will not be in the um, common catalog, but uh, Europe at this moment says, well, uh, your decision is not yet, with respect to uh, in vivo, is not acceptable. But the consequences uh, for Europe and for the market uh, of seeds, I would like to refer that to somebody who is specialized in European uh, seed legislation, which I certainly am not. Professor Rinzi, maybe you can comment on that? We, yes, um, it, is, it is very difficult to, to judge all that, but um, I, I mean, there are quite some uh, European varieties like, which are obtained uh, by this uh, mutagenesis uh, methods. And, I think uh, might have uh, catas catastrophic consequences uh, for European agriculture. Uh, like, and, um, yeah, um, so, it, I mean, uh, as far as, as, as I can judge, uh, like, uh, there are many uh, SMEs uh, now in, like, in Europe uh, like working on crop improvement. We, we are following now uh, two directions. They still continue with genome editing, and we come back to that maybe later. And uh, because it's uh, such an, a rapid, affordable, and easy method, and on the other hand, you have, uh, they continue with uh, mutagenesis techniques and some of them are in, in vitro, like, and, uh, because that's the way it works, like, in fact, like, and, and that creates uh, uh, a terrible conflict. It's a very expensive method because you create so many mutations. And so it's, uh, I think uh, the, we will losing at all fronts, and like I think in Europe, if you continue with that, uh, let's say legislation, like it is progressing now and seem to, pro uh, to progress now in, in France. It is not yet in force. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. let's hope it's 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 not yet in force. And um, one of the remarks made by the uh, European Commission is also that the French decision, if implemented, will lead to a clear disruption of the single market, and uh, that you will get uh, quite different uh, legislation. But I would like to abstain from commenting on seed legislation. Mr. Kusters, you want yeah, I, I, one um, um, additional comment. Um, the French NGOs were uh, very much opposed to the use of specific herbicide tolerant uh, varieties. And um, well, depending on how, how the, the, the final legislation will be enacted in France, this may indeed result that some herbicide tolerant um, oil seed uh, rape varieties will be taken off the French market. Uh, what, what I don't understand um, why this is so heavily uh, pursued by, by the NGOs, because taking from the market uh, a herbicide tolerant variety um, is ignoring the fact that um, 
if you don't um, uh, grow that herbicide tolerant variety, they will grow other varieties and every conventional farmer will use herbicides on their farm. Okay, they will use other herbicides than uh, the herbicide for which that one specific variety uh, was resistant against. Um, so it's very difficult for me to grasp why there is such a, such a hunt against um, specific herbicide tolerant varieties um, as if there is no understanding of the fact that um, herbicides are much more widely used also in uh, varieties that are not carrying those specific uh, tolerances. I'm not in a position really to speak on behalf of Confédération Paysanne, as you can understand, but if you read uh, the French decision of, uh, the Europe, of the Council, the Council of State, the first decision of uh, uh, 2016, the referral decision, then the arguments are brought forward. And I remember that one of the arguments is that if you use herbicide tolerant varieties, the uh, herbicide tolerance uh, may spread to weeds and these weeds will become more tolerant and you will need more and more and stronger and stronger herbicides to eliminate them. Uh, this is what I read and I don't uh, try, pretend to give a decent uh, presentation of their arguments. But it's interesting if one would also read this first decision of the French Council of State to better understand what uh, the whole thing is all about. I would like to finish upon this discussion points we have, because we have uh, more points to discuss. And so I would like to give the floor to Professor Push Domenic to give some more details about his opinion on the relation between genome alterations and general and genome editing and the science-based risk analysis that should be done. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will start by following, uh, by confirming the statement of Professor Bogan that uh, for a scientist, uh, it is a very surprising debate and a debate that would not, ne never have been uh, given to, to judges and to the higher court. It is a debate that has a very strong changing and complex scientific uh, background and probably the courts they do their job, as uh, Professor Wokken has very clearly uh, stated, but they have a very difficult job in uh, just uh, understanding the, the, end, the, the, the basis of these questions. In fact, the, one of the points that I would like to, to start with is that uh, genome editing is just uh, a way of providing new types of genetic variability for being used in plant breeding. Plant breeding is a, it's a, the, the basis of our agricultural system. Uh, farmers uh, try to use the best possible seeds that they can find adapted to their needs, to their needs of, uh, of productivity, but also of quality and also to their local environment and the input they want to, to put and the profit they can get, they can to, to, to get. So they need to have as much, as many possible seeds that they can, uh, can have. And um, it is what uh, now cooperatives, industries, small and big are proposing to the farmers. And genome editing is a way to, create, to provide to those who make the job of making the best possible seeds uh, to new types of variability. And uh, uh, for doing that, I will have to, to, to make, uh, make it precise. You have to do the job in, 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 in the laboratory to edit a specific gene needs uh, it is a, for a for, for well-equipped lab, it is a relatively easy way to do it, but you only have to, to have the knowledge, you have to have the technologies, you have to have the environment to do it, uh, because you have to deliver the DNA 
or the ribonucleoproteins that are able to make the process of uh, gene editing. And then to identify the, the plants that have been rightly uh, modified. And then, of course, these, these, uh, these plants, once you have those that have been created this new type of variability as precise as possible, uh, then you introduce these plants into the breeding uh, programs uh, that uh, exist for every specific uh, crop. So delivery is one question. A second question is what we uh, know as uh, of target or different types of modifications. The, what we know is that uh, uh, the system of uh, genome editing, especially the CRISPR-Cas9 system is able to, be, to precisely disrupt a gene in a specific place. Uh, what it happens there, it may be uh, afterwards because we know that the system of repairing DNA is not very efficient, so it creates different types of modifications. And it may happen that also some parts of the, uh, of the genome may be modified. Uh, that for what you call off-target uh, modifications. So some people think that it may produce some kind of risk that it may alter other parts of the genome. If you consider that uh, these, uh, if you that the, the, the genome edited plants are entering um, a program of breeding, this is normally not uh, any a problem because uh, these plants have to be uh, entering, so crossing to other varieties, varieties that we know very well. And this crossing, you can, uh, you have very, good, uh, very well-developed uh, technologies that allow you to only introduce in the, these varieties only a fragment of DNA that contains exactly the precise uh, modifications that you have uh, produced. So you have to take into account that some things may happen, but we have solutions that uh, are normally being applied in our breeding programs. Another of the questions that are important is what kind of candidates? So what kind of genes you want to modify? And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is based in the growing knowledge that we have now about molecular genetics of plants that is increasing, but we have now a wealth of knowledge that every day our laboratories are publishing and uh, getting new results. And, um, but uh, you have to be precise on what kind of modifications you have and that these modifications would produce traits which are interesting for the farmers. If uh, candidate genes are modified and then this modification has not, it's not producing a trait which is of interest, it is useless. Eh? So we have to have that. And I think that one of the points that uh, in, during the last uh, year after the symposium of uh, last, last year has appeared is that in, in the symposium, we produced a list of possible uh, programs of possible genes, possible plants that uh, will benefit or will be produced from the genome editing uh, technologies. But now these things are going very fast. And you just want you just have to to enter in the, the database that is uh, in the USDA uh, Department of Agriculture of uh, of the United States that uh, express and contains the list of uh, uh, candidates that have been proposed to the USDA asking whether they have to be regulated. That has two consequences. One is that the United States these genome edited plants are not being regulated, number one. Second, if, if you just consult this list, you will have today a list of 168 different candidates that uh, uh, companies, universities, uh, and small companies are producing. So that means that there is a growing 
uh, a growing uh, list, a growing quantity of, of plants uh, that uh, are being uh, modified. I think that this list is interesting because uh, they, they contain not only um, big crops, so maize, uh, soybean, which already are there, of course. There are not only big companies which are working in these uh, uh, modifications, but also universities and also small companies. So I think that uh, just it shows that uh, uh, these technologies uh, may, may benefit not only big companies, but also it may benefit small companies, may, may open the door to, for instance, universities applying uh, these technologies, and that will uh, make possible that uh, farmers which are interested in very specific conditions for their own crop, for their own cultivation, may have uh, 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 the benefit of these uh, technologies. Uh, of course, uh, we are uh, we we uh, we need that uh, these uh, uh, these new plants uh, have the the potential of being used using the the, the kind of conditions that we are interested uh, in. The, for instance, in some of the ethical reflections about these questions, uh, the the, the conditions are that new technologies are applied in a way that ensures the access of food to people, which is not so evident even at this moment during the present crisis. We still, we, the number of people who have not uh, enough uh, access to food, even in Europe, it's increasing. So it is not a trivial way, even if as Europeans, we can go to a market and we see a wealth of food and a wealth of plants, richness of varieties that is absolutely unheard of in the past. But food security, it's number one. We have to work for food security. Number two, we have to uh, ensure that the food that arrives to our consumers and that for Europe is a very important question is safe. So we don't introduce any problem of food safety in, in our, with the new technologies. And I think that if we consider that this is just an auxiliary to plant breeding, which is not a question of a, te a technology that appears in 2001, it's something that, as Professor Linz has said, it's um, coming from the beginning of the agriculture and in a scientific way, more than 100 years. And we are applying that. So we have a very long record of safety about uh, plant breeding. So, uh, but we have to be sure and we have to ensure and everything has to be done uh, for that. Another question that also was discussed in the, in the symposium, I will just mention, uh, the, it is the discussion is there in the report, is question intellectual, intellectual property. Uh, intellectual property is a complex issue. It's, a, it's an issue which is important for the breeders. It's important for the consumer. It's important for the perception that we have. And uh, I think that we have systems of intellectual property that uh, protect the one that has made the effort to produce a new variety. And probably uh, a matter to be discussed is whether the uh, patent law is adapted to these plants or not. And this is an important discussion uh, that was also a question. So ethical issues were discussed, um, intellectual property also uh, uh, were discussed. And I think that uh, with that, we could, uh, uh, it will be important to have the opinion of, of uh, consumers, the opinion of farmers uh, to introduce these new technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pidomenech. Um, anybody of the panel that wants to ask uh, question or comment on that. I think you made the perfect introduction to go to the next point because uh, Mr. René Kursters will continue on uh, detection of gene edited events and 
how the different legislations could disrupt um, international trade. As you mentioned, um, 160 or 180 gene edited events have already been submitted to the United States um, government to ask for exemption. So what will this do with the rest of the world and especially with Europe? Mr. Kusters? I'm going to start with a variation of a slide that Dirk Inze has already shown in, in terms of um, the difference between uh, um, or, or uh, the similarities between what is happening in nature um, uh, or when you apply mutagenesis, uh, genetic modification or, or genome editing. Uh, in, in nature, you have uh, random mutations, uh, but with genome editing, you can specifically make those same mutations. You can also make them using um, random mutagenesis. Um, with genetic modification, where it is um, mostly about the introduction of an additional piece of DNA, and in most cases, that is a piece of DNA that is not from within the gene pool or has some parts that are not from within the gene pool. Um, this insertion really creates a borderline and creates a unique uh, border insert uh, sequence at this point. And that is um, in fact a very unique uh, genetic signature that you have when you um, apply, I would say the traditional genetic modification introducing additional pieces of DNA. Um, with genome editing, you don't do that. Um, and that is where, why there is a big difference between uh, the things that um, you can do in terms of um, detection of genetic modification and detection of, of genome editing. Yeah? Genome editing, when you use genome editing for the introduction of a specific mutation, this does not create a unique genetic signature. Uh, that's, that's, that's very important. Um, let's dig into a specific situation then. Um, this is the world and we are um, having trade all over the world, uh, shipping commodities from one place to the other. Um, let's, let's imagine a bulk load of pink grapefruits that is on its way to Europe. When we have pink grapefruits um, and maybe that ship is, is entering in the harbor of Antwerp, and a food inspector in the harbor of Antwerp says, well, let me, let, let, let me take a sample of those uh, pink grapefruits. He takes a sample, uh, does a genetic test, uh, reads out the, the DNA of that uh, pink grapefruit, and he detects the presence of one specific mutation that causes the pink flesh color. He said, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, but then the, in, in terms of, of um, the discussion that we're having about genome editing and, and, and the legislation and, and the differences with genetic modification, here we are confronted with a problem because we can very well identify, uh, prove the presence of a specific mutation, but there is no way you can determine what the cause of that mutation is. Is that coming from a natural spontaneous event is that coming from uh, the appl application of mutagenesis, or is this coming from the use of genome editing as a, te as a technology? That creates enforceability problems in the legislation. And I will use another example to further exemplify that. We can have other examples of all kinds of uh, commodities coming into Europe. Uh, soybeans, you name it, maize, oil, seed, uh, rape, um, uh, rice um, and much more. And when we have bulk loads coming in, that of, is of course um, very much a mixture of all kinds of varieties of soybean or all kinds of varieties of maize, of all kinds of varieties of, uh, of oil seed rape or rice. And when that inspector in the harbor then again wants to do um, uh, GMO detection and enforce the GMO legislation, he will then take a sample and then perhaps find the following situation where he will not find um, uh, a mutation present in, in all of the sample, but he will find a mutation somewhere in, in, in uh, coming from one soybean from, from the sample. Um, 
Further on in the chain, you can have all kinds of matrices that are much more complex foods. And, and also in that context, um, the legislation, GMO legislation has to be enforceable. And because of the fact that you cannot uh, really prove what technology has been uh, used when you find a, the presence of a mutation in a small amount in a sample, that will create a, a situation that, that um, makes, enforce, uh, uh, makes enforcing the legislation very difficult. And if somebody would challenge that in, in court, I think um, in courts, um, finding uh, such a mutation uh, will never be accepted as proof of, of the use of, uh, of these technologies. So that is a very important uh, point, I think. Uh, it, ha it has been made uh, in, in different occasions already. Um, moving to the next point in the discussion is then, um, and I again repeat a, a picture that Dirk has already shown, um, but of course we're in a situation there uh, worldwide where um, the legislation differs from region to region in, in the world. Huh? Uh, Dirk has already explained uh, we are more strict in Europe um, and in other places in the world they have at least made very explicit in the legislation that uh, in, in certain cases, when you achieve certain types of modifications, that the resulting organisms will not be well treated as a GMO and, and can be put on the market following simple procedures. Um, those plants will be grown uh, and, and those plants will be uh, traded worldwide or the products will be traded worldwide. Um, with the disharmony that we have in the legislation, this will, uh, is very likely to uh, result in, in, in disruptions of trade or problems in, in trade. Uh, and and uh, the situation I discussed uh, that may occur in the harbor of Antwerp may occur in other places as well. These differences uh, in, in, in the way things are handled worldwide in terms of legislation also creates, uh, I think, unfair competition between farmers, traders, consumers, scientists, all over the world. And that is also very important. Um, we create a, create a situation where uh, in Europe, we have not the same abilities to uh, make good use, sensitive use uh, of these new, uh, new technologies. And I think that is also very important. We're in a global world. Uh, we should strive for harmony as much as possible all over the world. Um, and I think we also have the situation that, that uh, as, as resulting from this situation with the lots of discussion that we're, we're having in Europe, that, that being in plant science, um, if you are a young scientist, um, you may perhaps um, ask yourself twice whether or not this still is a very interesting field, because maybe in other parts of the world, things are moving on more swiftly. That is also a very important aspect that we need to take along in the discussion about genome editing legislation and the way we want to improve our uh, uh, agriculture and food production system. Then we go to the next point, which comes uh, as a logical consequence. Uh, what are the economic consequences for European agriculture and small and middle enterprises? So I give the word now to uh, Professor Inzi to say something about that. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Geisen. Um, many points have already been uh, been raised. Uh, like, and um, I think uh, maybe um, uh, to make some comments uh, like on what my uh, my colleagues said. I think if you look to the worldwide um, map uh, like of uh, what's happening in the field of genome editing, and I'm really talking here from the point of view of a scientist, it's just um, overwhelming. It's um, it's a technology, like in fact, like which is now used at a scale which is um, never seen, like in many different crops, like all over the world. And we talked a little bit about um, what's happening in the uh, in the US in the US, and then with this hundred, um, almost 170 varieties, which are now uh, waiting to be approved, uh, like in fact, uh, like uh, only uh, um, by USDA and this AFIS uh, database. But um, and we are also very much aware, for example, that uh, China is pushing extremely hard. Like, and this uh, every day, like, and, uh, literally uh, hundreds of publications are like, published. So there's no doubt about that. That this technology will revolutionize agriculture. 
It will uh, create um, more healthy food. I mean, we see, for example, now food coming, which has uh, really health benefits. If you make French fr potatoes, where uh, if you make French uh, fries, you have certain toxic products that are produced. Well, you can make potatoes, or you can select breeding potatoes, which do not do not do that anymore. Or you can have. Um, uh, for example, they also uh, they don't scientific, but it will be commercialized. For example, gluten-free wheat uh, that for um, which is all these health benefits. Uh, I think it will also lead to to a whole variety of crops which are much more eco-friendlier. So by managing um, the resistance to pests, like in fact, like and um, this is sometimes very difficult to do by uh, breeding. Eh? That's um, um, given, the example was given uh, like by one of the speakers at the symposium, but it's a very good example, like the Sangiovese grape, like it's, um, which is so so important for, for wine industry in Italy. Uh, well, this Sangiovese has certain characteristics, uh, an ensemble of genes which makes the typical flavors very complex, hundreds of different molecules. And I can, so uh, you cannot breed all that because if you, as soon as you cross it with another grape variety, in fact, you lose the characteristics. So Sangiovese is Sangiovese. But in Unfortunately, it's very, very sensitive to uh, certain uh, fungal diseases. You have to spray it with fungicides. Of course, it's a pressure green deal to reduce that. And you can use uh, other solutions like copper sulfate as an organic solution, which is also very toxic for the environment. But there's also a an, an solution to make, to make actually uh, the Sangiovese less susceptible by genome editing to the, to the fungus. And that's, uh, it's, it doesn't change anything, like in fact, in the in the flavor composition, it just, it makes it that you don't need to use any uh, chemical, any um, organic or anorganic copper sulfate uh, to, to, to do that. So, so we're going to miss out on all those this, uh, problems. Uh, the, there's also an, another uh, problem which is, uh, is going to, to affect us is, is just climate change. I mean, I think nobody doubts that also in Europe we're going to, to be hit very hard. In uh, just two years ago, we saw the overall uh, production uh, of crops in Europe going down actually by eight percent, which is it's really a lot. Uh, like, and uh, so, and I, I think also there we see that uh, enormous potential of genome editing, uh, like in fact, to make crops more resilient and uh, to speed up the breeding process. After all, it's a it's a breeding process, a kind of precision and breeding. So, so Europe has a choice. Either you we we pass on that, we're going to regulate a GMO and make it impractical, almost impossible to use this technology, and the rest of the world like will create varieties and use that. And what will and what we should avoid is that Europe is just on the sideline and going to to just import like crops like like we do now, for example, uh, with soybean. I mean, I think. Um, I mean, for example, we need uh, we need uh, a lot of uh, protein for uh, for feeding our animals, and of course, um, what's happening now with Europe actually has uh, uh, I mean made it impossible to grow uh, GMO classical GMO soybean, uh, for example, and it used to be grown in Romania and other places in the world because it's uh, it's not allowed. Well, well, but what we do actually is to import uh, millions of tons uh, like of soybean GMO from the United States, but also uh, from Brazil, which leads to a higher demand out there and more uh, deforestation and all these things. While in fact we we maybe uh, can actually do maybe using genome editing, we can actually also really improve a lot on the cultivation uh, like of uh, European uh, protein and uh, crop selects. So, I think we will lose out uh, like on um, on uh, in a, on a competitive edge. Like in fact, we will. Um, so we might. Um, it's very likely that we're going to left behind with a kind of old-fashioned uh, agriculture, which we really don't, don't have solutions to uh, problems. I think another important point is that um, that maybe many people. People might not realize is that breeding is an, really an international um, activity. So many companies, even small ones, and like they have breeding activities uh, like actually going on in Europe. They do field trials and like in fact, well, it, during summertime. And then in the wintertime, they move, for example, to Chile, to Argentina, actually to, to really to do the, 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 the same field trials and the same breeding. And, like, and then when it in, in these countries where the, in, the, in the winter, in, in our winter over there, 
that is then the summer elegan. And so, of course, if you regulate um, uh, products that that, one, that you, it might be very difficult uh, to to get this material uh, uh, across across like in fact uh, um, uh, from one continent to the other like, and in, in certainly when these products are like, or obtained uh, by uh, by uh, genome uh, genome editing like, and, and then and last but not least i think um, this is an um, is an efficient and an affordable and a very fast method. We know what has been um, uh, explained by uh, Push Nominek, Professor Push Nominek. It's uh, like we know uh, what we are doing. This is 40 years of molecular understanding of like what the gene like is, what the genes are doing like in the crop. We know very well what we are working with. Well, I think this this is an affordable technology, which in fact can be used by many small breeding companies to bring new varieties on the market. Market, new local varieties which add uh, to the, the biodiversity which gets uh, us rid uh, maybe more from the monocultures we're seeing in many different places and, and so I think uh, what we have to avoid that we come in the same situation as GMOs where only the big companies a few big companies in the world have the resources to bring this this product on the market I think we should just enable that small companies in Europe actually can use this technology to really to create solutions which or adapted uh, like for Europe and uh, like, to, to make them our agriculture even more eco-friendly uh, like, and uh, uh, to make our agriculture uh, climate resilient and and actually also to produce uh, maybe new products uh, like, which can uh, fit much better in the European landscape uh, like of agriculture like we all like to see it uh, like, and so it's um it is an uh, it's uh, I think um, it's a dream to be realized, uh, particularly for all the young people in this field, uh, like that. Uh, uh, that also, actually, this technology can be used uh, like uh, for European uh, agriculture for crop improvement. And of course, that doesn't mean that it is not regulated anymore. There is a very, there was already alluded uh, to. There's a very strict uh, regulation on food safety. Uh, like in fact, uh, any every variety, whatever it's ob obtained by classical breeding or by genome editing, has to go through an evaluation in terms of like of comparative analysis with other crops and like and maybe we might we might we might conclude as a legislator that we don't want certain application like herbicide resistance and so but that's that's another discussion it should not be the reason to block this technology thank you thank you professor Inzi. and do you have suggestions on how to convince the politicians that in uh, europe where we have a lot of importance uh, for traditional food, that that does not mean that you cannot do innovation for that traditional food. Yeah, it's an, an extremely important uh, point, Alec. And I think we uh, we scientists are extremely uh, bad in communication, as, well, because we also in this presentation, Alec, here we start merely to talk about uh, DNA, about genes, by mutants, like by genetic modification. All uh, all languages, a uh, language that we actually um, is is where many people are not familiar with, and which really make. Uh, so I think we have to really to explain with narratives uh, what the benefits are. I think that. The Sangiovese is a very beautiful model, and I think we can come up with many of these narratives. Like, in fact, really to to tell to people, look, this is an is in the technology which can help society and which can bring benefit for European citizens. But we have to keep it keep it like in a, in a kind of um, it's something that almost uh, that people can touch, like you know, which is uh, and certainly, uh, I mean. It's it's a difficult technology to explain, or you need to have a, I mean, uh, you need to have a good background in biotechnology really to understand all the complexity of how plants work, how this this thing works, and we should not try to do that. We have to really to get to the to translate it and what could it bring for for uh, advantages for European citizens. May I introduce another point? Yes, of course. Uh, I think that you 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 do. It's cause an interesting point. I mean, uh, I think that uh, uh, in Europe we are interested, for instance, in protecting what we call traditional varieties, or we protect uh, geographical production. Uh, uh, this number one, these uh, varieties have to be well defined. Uh, it is important for the consumer to be sure that uh, what he's getting is exactly the kind of uh, of uh, variety, even traditional one, traditional ones. 
time to time, I mean, we, we have we have worked here with a number of people who are in conservation of uh, cheap conservation in banks. It is important to 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 really define well. And molecular techniques are are very very well adapted for that eh? because then uh, the farmer knows that he is sure that he's using exactly the variety, and consumer may have the guarantee that he is uh, using uh, using that. Second point is that, as Professor Inze has said, that uh, it is something that you can, uh, is a technologies that you can use in the lab, in a well-equipped lab anyway, eh? but uh, in many labs you can do that. Uh, it is possible now to try to introduce interesting vari genetic variability in crops that have not been the subject of uh, breeding because they have complex traits which make them difficult to cultivate. Uh, and now there are examples of people who are working in interesting crops uh, that have been abandoned because they had lower productivity or resistant on the low resistance to pathogens or the quality, whatever it is. And now with these technologies, we can try to uh, get back this uh, this um, uh, variety, these species, these crops that. Uh, traditionally have been left behind. Eh? So there are a lot of possibilities that are open, not only for big companies, for big, uh, for big uh, uh, crops, but also for specific crops that can be very interesting for farmers eh? and for consumers. Thank you. Any other reaction? If not, then we go to the final discussion point with the panel. And this will be done by Dr. Dima, who will give a, a brief overview of the policy options that are also listed in the um, opinion. Thank you, Professor Heisen. Um, so to go to the introduction of the policy options, I would like to say that the ruling of the European Court of Justice brought legal unclarity on plants with genetic changes obtained through genome editing. And many researchers across the world have been using genome editing for targeted genetic changes by, for example, using CRISPR. With our current knowledge of biology, we are able to introduce certain plant characteristics by making small genetic changes, and it can be really changing just few letters of the genetic code. And these genetic changes can also occur spontaneously in nature and have been selected for what Professor Inze already said within 10,000 years and which resulted in the domestication of certain plants. So um, many researchers see a huge potential using this technology to make plants with improved characteristics for a more sustainable agriculture. And many assume also that genome edited crops with DNA changes that can as well spontaneously occur in nature are the same as crops with the same DNA changes that occur spontaneously. And as of consequences, as, as of consequence, these crops do not fall under the scope of the European GMO directives. However, the European Court of Justice ruling brought unclarity on the legal status of these genome edited crops. And therefore, uh, there needs to be a stable framework to facilitate research and innovation in Europe into new innovative solutions. And that solutions that we need very urgently given what's at stake. And that is why multiple actors have been looking into future policy options to enable applications of genome editing for more sustainable agriculture. And we are currently in the process of exploring which policy options would be most fit for purpose. And today I would like to uh, take the chance to present these policy options to you. And we have to still remember that still within any policy option, still an impact assessment will be necessary to assess which policy option is most, most fit for purpose to enable genome editing application for more sustainable agriculture that can be beneficial not only for consumers, but also for the environment. 
So I will present now these four uh, policy options. One, so the first option is, let's call it business as usual. And it's like um, that we keep the GM, uh, GMO directive as it is. Then, of course, we have all the problems that we've discussed already. So the problems that uh, small and medium enterprises will not be able to develop, all the trade disruptions that were uh, uh, discussed uh, by René. And most importantly, the interpretation of the uh, ruling will remain an issue. So uh, this was also already covered. This is illustrated by the current situation with the French decree. Now, second make a do with what we have. So the second option is to exploit existing mechanism in the European GMO legislation. And here we could use, for example, the possibility to introduce differentiated procedures for specific GMOs. And that would result in less elaborate dossiers and risk assessments uh, requirements for those uh, GMOs. Um, however, we have to then keep in mind that uh, still genome edited organisms are then regulated as GMOs. And besides, we have no experience with, um, with this approach. So um, let's move to the option number three, which is the harmonization. So the first, uh, the third policy options is to introduce limited changes to the European GMO legislation. And uh, the intention of these uh, limited changes would be to place those crops under the scope of the uh, European existing law in which changes have been introduced that can also arise spontaneously in nature. And these changes would bring the European GMO le legislation in line with the legislation of the other jurisdictions in the world. So what you can remember already from the map uh, shown already a few times during uh, this panel. Uh, so there are several options to do so. I will not go very much in detail here. I will just give an example. So it might be, for example, an amendment of the GMO definition or the amendment of the exemptions or both the amendment of the GMO definition and the exemptions. And this has been already covered by um, many uh, learned societies and the scientists, if, for example, in the Leopoldina statement or by the French uh, plant biotechnology associations or even by a students, by a growth scientific progress. Um, and the four, the, the last option is to go all the way. And uh, the fourth option is to undertake a more thorough uh, revision of the, of the European GMO legislation. And while well, the difficulty to, with attempting a more, the, the, the whole revision of the uh, GMO legislation, it, it's that it would expose the whole GMO directive to a much more fundamental discussion. And uh, such discussion will be difficult and lengthy, and uh, it is close to impossible to predict actually what um, type of regulatory regime will uh, then uh, result in. So um, summarizing all these uh, four options um, uh, that we are currently exploring the, to solve the current situation. So the business as usual, make do with what we have, the harmonization or going all the way. I think that the aim for harmonization would be the most fit for purpose solution to provide a straightforward legal framework and to facilitate genome editing in Europe into a new innovative and necessary solutions for a more sustainable agriculture. And with this message, I would like to finish my short introduction. Thank you, Dr. Dima. Do all the members of the panel agree that option three is the most uh, desired one or is one of you having a different opinion? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a different opinion, but, but maybe we, uh, I can elaborate a, a little bit more on that. Um, Oana, well, made, made a very clear statement. Well, the, the uh, decision of the European Court of Justice um, perhaps even created uh, some, some well, unclarity. Eh? Um, there is... There are a few things that are absolutely sure in, in terms of what the court ruling has meant. 
that is one thing that's absolutely sure is that the court has ruled that if you apply mutagenesis, the resulting organism is a GMO. What is also absolutely true is that the court has ruled that um, the application of targeted forms of mutagenesis and the modern targeted forms of mutagenesis, like for instance, uh, when you apply CRISPR in a certain way, that the resulting organism is not in the current exemption to the legislation. That is also absolutely true. Many people conclude then that that means that um, all genome edited organisms are um, um, subject to the European GMO legislation. There is some other opinion as well because the court has not really ruled on the uh, uh, interpretation of the GMO directive itself. But um, I think um, the current legislation still is a bit flu. I think the way the court has ruled um, is, is resulting from, um, I would say, some unclarity that is present in, in the current uh, directive. Professor Bockham has uh, made the statement that, um, well, the court is perhaps not the best place to make judgment on, on technical uh, issues, uh, uh, scientific issues uh, of things for which there is no legislation yet. Um, so in that respect, I think making a small change to the legislation that much more clarifies in wording what the actual co scope of the legislation should be, resulting in the clarification that um, certain forms of genome edited organisms, huh, where you have small changes, small mutations, where you don't introduce uh, additional DNA, that those are not uh, within the scope of the legislation, thereby also resulting in a harmonization at the international level. And I think that is also very important. And, and that is why I fully support that, that, that option. Uh, the, the second option that Juana uh, presented, uh, um, uh, or where you would try to use some mechanisms that exist within the current legislation to have sort of simplified procedure for certain types of, uh, of, of, of organisms. Um, that will result in, in the organism still being subject to the GMO legislation, still being subject to the legislation concerning labeling, uh, which puts a stigma on these things, um, and maintains the problems that I uh, elaborated on in terms of uh, the, the enforcement of the legislation. Um, the fourth, well, the, the last option she presented in terms of having a much more thorough revision of the legislation. I think a lot of scientists would like to have a much more science-based or risk-based um, approach in, in, in the legislation. Um, if you would go in, in depth into that discussion, it will turn out to be very difficult to come up with a system that, that uh, fulfills everything that we would like to see. Um, and it also, um, if we would start that discussion, um, Juana also correctly mentioned that already, uh, you don't know where you're going to end. And there you may end up in a situation where in Europe, again, we are in disharmony with the rest of the world. So if we would like to start a more basic discussion on what types of uh, criteria you want to use and what type of regulatory framework we want to have, um, I think that's a discussion we should not do as Europe alone. But that's a discussion that um, would benefit from a more, much more international approach. Thank you, Mr. Custos. If there are no more urgent responses from the panel members, I would suggest that we conclude here the discussion among the panel mem members and go to the audience. You can now write your uh, question into the chat. And while you're writing, I will already go to some that have been posted before. And one uh, question is, is it correct that uh, European Commission is considering the discussion on new breeding techniques urgently? And that this could be done before the Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy before they are rolled out as they believe that could, they could be part of the solution. Is that the correct ID?
Could I uh, comment yes, on sorry, that? My microphone was already off, I said. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe I will uh, respond uh, partially on this question, uh, but what was not mentioned yet during our panel discussion is that the European Commission has been uh, asked by the European Council to provide a study and to perform a study on new genomic techniques under the Union law. And uh, this uh, procedure was uh, started in November last year. And uh, it's going to uh, be published uh, most probably in April next year. So for this uh, study, there has been uh, some targeted um, uh, uh, approach uh, um, from the European Commission. They, they asked the member states on, on their, um, let's say, uh, uh, standpoint on, on new genomic techniques and also they asked uh, a number of the stakeholders. So uh, now the, the, this pool is closed, all the contributions have been submitted and we're waiting for uh, the outcome of the study and if appropriate also a proposal how to proceed with uh, let's say with the new genomic techniques or, or genome editing call it as you uh, wish. So um, that's why I was uh, talking about the unclarity because even the commission is now uh, performing this study to, to come up with some, I suppose, some guidelines on what to or, or how to deal with the genome edited crops. And I really very much hope so that genome edited crops are going to be uh, enabled uh, and the, the potential of the genome edited crops is going to be enabled uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, that uh, what was also mentioned before, genome edited uh, crops can really contribute to the farm to fork strategy. So, so I think that might be a very useful approach to consider genome editing within farm to fork strategy. As uh, Dirk already mentioned, uh, we can contribute to the re reduction of the pesticides with genome editing of using uh, pesticides, uh, or um, we can even contribute to um, better, let's say, organic farming. So anyways, I think there it's a very good technique to, to think about uh, for the farm to fork strategy. Professor Inzi? Uh, just to uh, add to this uh, valuable comment, uh, like I think, and the, also the, the European Commission uh, that, that is actually uh, using an effect-based uh, approach now. Like so, all the all the stakeholders were asked to uh, answer a number of uh, questions and like and to provide documentation of uh, claims which are made. That is also what what the symposium uh, concluded. And like in fact uh, that. We should have a more uh, science-based like approach, a fact-based approach, and not just um, making decision up on hypothetical, uh, unsupported um, uh, considerations. And again, and that's uh, uh, often that strategy is uh, is very uh, very much used in Europe. And like this is what is called the precautional principle. It's and like, and is a principle that says, uh, yeah, um, it's you can maybe not uh, demonstrate that it is harmful now, but maybe it's harmful for the for the next generation, and if not for the next generation, for the next next generation, and so it's actually it, it's um, it's uh, it without scientific uh, support like for that. Like and I think uh, uh, with with the current challenges that we have uh, for mankind, uh, I mean climate change and the global population, I mean uh, environmental deterioration. I think we should also ask the question, uh, like in fact the precautionary principle in revert it. And I mean. What would happen if we do not have this uh, technology? If we are still using old-fashioned, uh, old-fashioned breeding, uh, like we cannot adapt our varieties uh, to these uh, conditions, and maybe that's maybe also an, a question that uh, politicians should be able to uh, to answer. Actually, uh, like uh, we need we need to uh, to move uh, forward and to make our uh, agriculture system, food production, more healthy and uh, more eco-friendly, and that's. So what is really frustrating me uh, and many of my colleagues uh, all over Europe is that essentially we, we want to have the, the same as many and uh, as environmentalists. We want to have uh, a more um, eco-friendly uh, agriculture and, uh, and we should actually be able to join forces. 
So we're in the middle where we can achieve that in Europe and uh, can only um, only um, hope that uh, also the from a political point of view that will be taken uh, uh, serious in the coming uh, year. Thank you, Professor Inzi. I will uh, take two questions uh, that are a bit related and also related to what you just said. And I will um, shorten them so to make it uh, faster. Um, one of the questions is, can GMOs also be used in small scale agriculture? And the next question is, what about the bio sector? Um. Well, genome editing can, can, can also be used in, in small crops eh? and, and in small scale agriculture. It is not, um, well, the breeding the, the technology used does not determine in, in, in what size or what type of agriculture you uh, can use these crops. Um, I can even use uh, a genome edited pest resistant uh, carrot in, in my own garden. If, if, if I would like to. So, so that's, that's not uh, a, a, a difference. And I think, well, I do think there is an opportunity here in the sense that um, if we make sure that we don't create unsurmountable regulatory thresholds, then we will also allow the development of not only big crops in which genome editing has been used, but also much more in smaller crops for niche markets. Um, uh, and, and, and that I think will be beneficial for the use of these types of crops in all kinds of farming systems of all kinds of sizes. And then turning to the, the, to the, to the organic uh, sector, um, I think, um, the organic se uh, sector uh, is, is growing, is um, putting forward uh, a number of important things. Um, they are very much into soil fertility. That is, I think, a very positive thing, which the whole of agriculture can take lots of learnings from. Um, but on the other hand, I think there is a need and room for the combination of different approaches in agriculture where uh, the organic sector will have its place, but I think where also other approaches have uh, its place. Uh, lots of people are talking about small scale farming, uh, short chain, uh, locally grown, uh, etc. cetera. Um, uh, community uh, farming, uh, farming on roofs of, of, of rooftops in, in, in cities. Those are all important things and, and can, can contribute, but there is also because of, um, well, the, the, the large sustainability issues that we are confronted with on, on, on a global scale, there is a need for a very efficient and very productive form of agriculture as well. Because I don't think we will be able to fill the supermarkets of large cities with, with all kinds of small initiatives, which are very good. Um, but, but yeah, I think um, we'll not be able to achieve what we need in terms of global sustainability. Um, and in that respect, I also think it is very important that those different groups within agriculture or different sectors of agriculture should not fight each other. Um, I think that is that is a very important thing as well. It is not either or, but it is and and, and rather than fighting each other, we should be supporting each other. Uh, I think that is uh, also a very important thing. May I introduce just some question? Uh, even with uh, the the GMOs that we have at this moment, uh, of course we have a very limited experience because there is only one uh, that is uh, really being used in Europe. And it's essentially planted, planted in Spain. Eh? Uh, north of uh, my town, uh, we have a region which plants a lot of maize because they use it for feeding to animals. And this is a very windy region. Uh, and uh, when, uh, uh, if the corn borer, the insect pest arrives 
for instance, in very uh, wet uh, spring or summer times, then the, the corn borer makes holes in the, in the plant and with the wind falls down. Eh? And so the farmer loses the, 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 the crop. Eh? So in this region, and they have been using the, the only GMO uh, available, which is a, a, a maize, which is protected against the insect, and it protects. So the, the farmers, uh, they have hundreds in their catalogs of seeds. They have hundreds of varieties, and they choose whatever they like. And there are about 60 varieties that have the MON 880, 810, uh, modification. So uh, small farmers. Eh? And we have been we have been following, for instance, whether uh, there is uh, cross pollination, and it's very low because the the pollen of maize does not travel; it's very heavy, and there is no problem because also they use different varieties and they pollinate, they flower at different times. So small farmers can use even present time GMOs for their own uh, uh, crops whatever they like, you have to have. In fact, these farmers, when you ask them, they, they would like to have other varieties that protect against the insects. Or, uh, so, the, uh, and other traits which are useful for them. Yeah? So even present day uh, GMOs help small farmers yeah? when they have problems like this one. Yeah? Uh, just think about uh, techniques which are easier because in the present day regulations, one thing that is this very expensive to get approved. Huh? So to get approved uh, a, a variety, it can cost millions of, of euros just to make a dossier. No? So that makes that big companies may afford to invest, small companies cannot afford. So in fact, with these regulations, we are excluding small companies. We are excluding solutions for niche farmers. Huh? So, uh, and th this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, we, we, we think that these techniques which are easier, which may be used in a much more variety of crops and for much more variety of uh, solutions for farmers, it will be a pity to use this very expensive, very heavy type of regulation uh, that make a complete obstacle that makes exclude uh, the, the universities, exclude uh, the search centers to, to apply it and to exclude the small farmers to be used. And that is one of the reasons that we, we, we are, that's the reason why we are discussing at this moment. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Push Dominic, um, for this uh, interesting Spanish experience that you, you brought in. I will choose a final question because we need to end on that, maybe two, I see another one coming up. But one uh, question that I saw is that um, at the European level, they have been discussing these new techniques since 2007, even before CRISPR was there. And how can we now bring the um, uh, feeling of emergency that it has to change to keep the research and development in Europe. Who would like to comment on that? Yeah, a, 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 brief, a brief comment, I think. Um, there is a difference uh, with these new breeding techniques, um, which were discussed before the discovery of um, uh, the use of uh, genome editing. I mean, these were really difficult techniques to do. Like, in fact, like, I mean, um, so they, um, uh, th this technology really require a lot of work. Like, in fact, very few academic labs were actually approaching that. Uh, companies really see that as a big hurdle to step in this technology. And that is, uh, that makes it also that the pressure actually, the urgency really to change something maybe was less elegant. But now, I mean, uh, with this genome editing, I mean, I think that is clear from what is all in the pipeline and what we can see. And uh, I mean, we can only see the commercial pipeline in the US because it's open, but I'm sure there are a huge amount of other uh, opportunities now developed all over the world. I think the urgency becomes 
much, much, much more, uh, uh, much greater. And I think, uh, and that you see also in the in the reaction of the scientific community. Yeah? I mean, this is uh, unisono all over Europe, uh, like very loud and clear. All different organizations uh, like, are asking for the same the same revision uh, like of of this uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice. I think that explains uh, like it. Thank you. I will now go to the really final question because I see now several popping up, but we, we have to conclude on this discussion. But it's an important one. The question is, what about IP issues? Could that restrict the application of this technology on small crops? Uh, this is a, a complex, a very technical issue. It has two phases. One phase is that we have to protect people who make the effort to develop uh, new products who can be useful for the public and for farmers. So we have to have some way of protecting uh, the effort. Second one, we have a way that everyone can use uh, the benefits of uh, uh, the science. Huh? So this is a discussion that it's going on in Europe. We have to do it, this discussion. And uh, there are several uh, solutions for that. Uh, one is that uh, plants have a tradition, what tradition? Uh, a way of protecting plant varieties, which is an international convention that is very, very well applied to plant varieties because it protects the one, the breeders that have developed a new variety. But at the same time, this, the, the, the content, the genetic uh, content of these varieties are open to other ones to use it. So some people, including myself, think that this is a better adapted uh, legislation for plants that applying the typical um, pat patent legislation. In Europe, we have uh, a directive on uh, patents for biotechnology application that have some exceptions, for instance, plant varieties. Uh, uh, it has been a lot of discussions about that, about genes, about uh, plants, not plant varieties. In my opinion, we should go towards a system in the, in the way that it was in the Convention of Protection of, of Plant Varieties to make equilibrium, eh? to make a, a good equilibrium. There are other, other proposals. For instance, um, I belong to an ethics committee in France, and we have proposed that uh, public institutions should increase the effort of, uh, of research on genome editing and to get uh, uh, some kind of uh, IP on this, on this and make it open. I mean, make some kind of common uh, on open science of co common uh, uh, resources for that. I mean, there are, there is a very important discussion. It is not an easy one, but I think that we should afford, and there are solutions, there are ideas around. Reactions from uh, other panel members? If not, then I would like to give the final word to Professor Push Dominic for some concluding remarks, if he still has, because he already gave some conclusions. The microphone is off. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No, I think that they are written in the report. Um, we conclude in a number of concluding remarks in this report, but I think they are valid one year afterwards. I think that those are valuable techniques that have to be applied. They can help us to solve uh, problems for agriculture and food production uh, in the framework of, of plant breeding. Uh, we have to recognize that food production in Europe is very sensitive issue. Uh, it is, um, we, we have uh, uh, the need, we have been accustomed to a big, a very uh, varied production of food. We know that uh, food is essential for our health, for our culture, uh, for many, aspects of our uh, system, I mean, for our life. So we have to be aware of that. Eh? That uh, all that I think we, is what we say on that. Um, at the same time, the present legal framework has contradictions. Uh, it is 
uh, we see the need to, uh, it, and, and as Professor Bogen has very, very well said, it is not the, the, the role of the course to solve scientific or industrial uh, questions. Uh, so I think that uh, we discuss all things and that uh, at the end, our concluding remark is, it seems that there is not an option for Europe uh, to do nothing is not an option on Europe in the present situation. I think is the concluding remark, which is in the report, which is open in, the, in our academy uh, website. Thank you. Thank you, very important conclusion. I would like to thank all the panel members for their participation in this discussion and also the audience for putting up some questions. And I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.